Good morning, everybody. Let's stand together and let's sing. He has made me glad. It is well with my soul.
Amen. Let's pray. Father, you're our shield and our help. And, and Father, you make a way where there is no way in our life that we see. But Lord, we know that it's your time and not ours. And we pray, Lord, that you are that to us today. That we depend on you. That we can say it is well with our soul. Because we put our hope and our trust and our faith in you, the one who is and was and always will be. Lord, be with us in this service today. We praise you, we worship you, and we pray that you are pleased with the efforts of our praise today. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Have a seat just for a moment or two, maybe two today, <clears throat> just so that we can welcome you here today and tell you we're glad to see you, and, um, and we're glad that you chose to be in Hepzibah, this building that's called Hepzibah, because Rick's always says we don't come to church. Why? Because we are the church. Amen. Uh, this building is where we meet, and we're glad that you chose to be here to meet with us today. Amen. And uh, in a few minutes, we're going to stand and greet one another and you can find somebody you hadn't seen in a while or find somebody that you rode to church with today just to tell them you're glad that they're here and, uh, and you're glad to see them in, in God's house today. But if you're visiting with us, there are some connection cards in the pew in front of you. And uh, if you'd fill one of those out and put it in the offering boxes in the hallways at the end of the service, we'd love to have a record of your attendance today, get to know you a little better, and also pray along with you if you have something in your life that you feel like the staff could, could pray and intercede on your behalf and, and reach out and, and, and pray to our Heavenly Father, who's the only one, right? So um, we're glad you're here. Um, I want to make one little, uh, little plea this morning. If you uh, are up here or not up here but should be up here, we're meeting on Sunday afternoons at 3.30. If there's some of you that would like to help us sing for Christmas this afternoon at 3.30 and on Wednesday nights, whoo, that's all we're doing right now. So uh, you're welcome to jump in. If you've been going, well, I might want to jump up in the choir and sing a little bit. Now's your time. You come on, sing for Christmas, and then next year we'll, we'll put you to work every Sunday. Amen? Let's stand together. Adam and I are going to play. And let's turn around let's greet each other this morning. Bow before the Lord. 
the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. Open up the gates, make way before the king of Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Lion of Judah is roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. As I know there is peace within your presence, I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name. Every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is
darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Well, um, that's, uh, that's something. I, I, don't know. I don't know if that makes you evil and me good. I, I'm not sure what to make of it. But thank you. Thank you for, for whoever put that together. Um, Pastor Appreciation is always a wonderful month to be able to, to thank the, the church for all that you do for us. Because, um, yes, while you're thanking us, we couldn't do it without your love and support and um, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm speaking for you, but I couldn't do it without a good woman um, who helps keep me accountable, and I would say that Missy's probably the same. She'd keep you in line. You would have burned down the world if it was left up to just you. Um, Amy is at home with our youngest who has hand, foot, and mouth thanks to uh, daycare, so she's watching online, um, and we just celebrated our ninth anniversary uh, this past week, so thank you for, for celebrating with us on that. First Peter is where we're going to be this morning, First Peter chapter 1. We are continuing our sermon series through the book of First Peter that we are calling Exiles. Peter starts out in the very first uh, section of First Peter and says that we are called as elect exiles. Yes, he was writing to the exiles of the dispersion, these Jewish Christians that he is talking to. But also for you and I, we are exiles in this world. This world is not our home. Every day, whenever the news comes on, whenever I look around, whenever I go out into the world, whatever it may be, I am reminded that this is not our home, that this world is becoming more divisive, it is becoming more cynical, it is becoming more silly, <laughs> it is uh, becoming a whole lot of something. And as we look around, we are called to be exiles in this world. This is not our home. We are supposed to bear the salt and light of the gospel everywhere that we go. So first, Peter, as he is writing this book, he reminds the readers of three main things that he goes through throughout this book. 
I'm recapping so that we understand where we're going to pick up in today of 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Last week, we talked about how the main three themes of Peter are for you and I to have our hope set on a living hope. Our hope is not in a 401k. Our hope is not in a house. Our hope is not in a home, a car, a, a job, a whatever. Our hope is in the living Jesus Christ. It is not on a tomb, it is not on a grave, it is not on the good works and the good teachings. It is on the empty tomb of Jesus Christ who has risen forever. And that is where we must place our hope as we live as exiles in this world. And this hope that Peter talks about is a deep-rooted hope that is inside of us. It is not a blind optimism. It is not some sort of Jesus bumper sticker theology of, well, Jesus 2024, we're just going to use that as a cliche to have hope in this election because we don't have hope for any candidate. We're just going to use a, a bumper sticker theology to guide us and lead us in this life. That is not what Peter is talking about. All those things may be good and well, but Peter is talking about a, a deep-rooted hope, not a blind optimism. The second thing Peter talks about is that we must endure suffering. This world is going to give you problems. Whether it's in your past, in your present, or in your future, at some point you are going to have troubles in this world. Peter described it in the first part of 1 Peter as various trials. And these various trials that will come your way is not just the person that you're sitting next to. The various trials that you may have in your life are the things that are around you in life, the persecution that comes just for you believing in your faith persecution that you have at work for praying before a meal or for not doing what your boss wants you to do because it is against your ethical boundaries. Persecution is going to come in one way or another, so you and I must endure suffering. Peter talked about how this suffering has a way to burn away the false hopes in our life. Whenever we go through trials, we may not understand it in that moment, but at some point in the various trials that we have, we that false hope just seems to wash away. Peter's point in this book is that enduring these various trials are an important indicator of our true status in Christ. That when you go through trials, what Peter links back to what Jesus talked about in Luke chapter 8 and many of the other gospels record this parable as well. That of the seed that fell, the ones that burned away because of the various trials were those that didn't really have a deep root in their life. So Peter plays on this and talks about how trials help highlight our status in Christ and whether it is real or not. The third thing that Peter talks about in his main themes of this book and in the first section that we looked at last week is that our hope is in the future glory that we are going to inherit, not in this present life. Every day I wake up and I look in the mirror, I'm reminded that my hope is not set on my body. I get a little bit older, a little bit wrinklier. I have another gray hair, however few there are on my head. I have another gray one that pops up, it seems like, every morning. Every morning when I wake up, I have to put a little bit more WD-40 on my joints to get up and get going. Some of you are there as well, although further down the, down the road than I am. This, this glory that is on the earth ain't it. Our hope and our future is not in an election. It is not in a job promotion that is coming down the road. It is built in a resurrection body where there will be no more pain, where there will be no more suffering. This is the future hope that we should orient our entire lives around. That when we look around, we should understand that we're not rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic because the ship is going down. We're not trying to put paintings up in a hotel room. We're trying to look forward to the coming glory of Jesus Christ. This is what Peter talks about in this first section. He's going to highlight every single one of these themes throughout his book. Today, we are going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Look with me there. Peter says, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, every time there is a therefore in Scripture, we should understand that the writer is linking to what was just before and what he is continuing on with. Peter's saying, therefore, because of all the things that I just went back over, the three main themes that Peter is going to cover in this book, because of all of that, therefore, this, and he gives a command. Now, I know I'm about to make some of your teeth cringe, 
Some of you are going to be really happy, namely my wife and any other English teachers that are in here. What is the command that Peter just gave in verse 13? Some of you are already cringing at this because diagramming sentences reminds you of watching paint dry. I know diagramming sentences has been a long time for some of you. What is the, what is the action? What is the verb that Peter is calling us to? It is to set our hope. That is the command. Preparing our minds, being sober-minded, all of those help reinforce what the command that Peter is giving here. Set your hope fully. This is our first point this morning, is that we are called to hope fully. That is two separate words where our hope is fully in Christ. Not hopefully it will rain today. Hopefully it will get cooler this week. Hopefully this, hopefully that. That is not what Peter is talking about, about a blind sense of optimism. What Peter is saying is put all of the weight of your hope on Christ. So Peter says that we should hope fully. Let me just say this, church. Hope is a choice. Hope is a choice. We don't wake up one day all of a sudden in the midst of pain and suffering and trials and the hardness of waking up just to roll out of bed when you understand all that life has for you that day. You don't just wake up and all of a sudden you're just in a hopeful mood. Maybe some of you wake up on the wrong side of the bed and you're in a bad mood. Maybe some of you wake up on the right side of the bed and you're in a good mood and everything's fun and jovial that day and it's just, it's just one of those days. Hope is a choice. When you and I dwell on our pain and our suffering and the bad hand that you've been dealt in this particular moment, you are choosing to fuel and feed the anxiety the depression, the anger, the bitterness, the loneliness, the resentment. You can wake up and you can have that choice to dwell on all of those bad things or you can wake up and choose to have hope in Christ. You cultivate gladness and love and hope and gratitude and so many other good things this morning. And I'm not trying to stand up here and pretend like this is going to be an easy thing. Just wake up out of the bed and choose hope tomorrow or today. What I am saying is that Peter's message is called for you and I to set our hope. Set is an action, a choice. It is a mindset that you and I can enter into every single day or not. Hope is a choice. Maybe, if you, maybe some of you know the people in your life, or maybe some of you have this particular spiritual gift that many people think they have of criticism and cynicism. These people think they have the spiritual gift because every single time that you tell them about how something is going good, they have something negative to say. They're a one-upper. You made a 95 on their test, and they have to tell you because they were just itching to tell you that they made a 98. You wake up and you have a new car. Great, they're going to have one next week. You talk about how this went right or wrong in the football game yesterday, and they got something even better to say. These people have the spiritual gift of cynicism and criticism. They are never satisfied. They are never happy in life. They always have something negative to say. You got a half inch. Oh, it should have been an inch. We still need more rain. It's just, it's just like Eeyore. It's just hard to be around those people. I think that many of these just don't have their hope set in the right place because many of them dwell on the sadness and the darkness and while those people may have the spiritual gift of cynicism and criticism, I've said this before, and I think many of you it resonates well with. While those people may have the gift of cynicism, they cannot say anything to me that is worse than what I have said to myself. No one is meaner to me than me. How about you? You want to give a compliment after the sermon today for Pastor Appreciation Month. Thank you for all you do. All, that's, all those things are great. The, the gift of cynicism and criticism, you want to throw those my way? Awesome. It compares nothing to what I throw at myself on the ride home on Sunday morning. It compares nothing to what I say to myself in the office on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. No one is meaner to me than me. How about you? 
If some of y'all said the things that I say to myself on the quiet moments of my life, I would lay hands on some of y'all. I'm not talking about a spiritual praying for like we just did up here. I'm talking about like we, we're going to go to war, right? If anybody said what I thought about my wife or my children inside of my head, because that's where the negative thoughts are, right? They, very few of us actually vocalize what the things are that are swirling around in my head or your head. We'd have problems if you said those things to my wife or my children. And yet inside of our minds, we fuel the demons and the negative thoughts that rob us of our hope in this world. You're mad at your family right now, awesome. You're mad at your boss right now, okay. You're mad at your wife or your kids or whatever the situation is in your life. You can choose to dwell on those things or you can choose to dwell on the good things of Christ. This is why Paul said it so well in Philippians chapter 4 verse 8. Paul says, finally brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worth praise, think about those things. Dwell on those things. You see, Peter, when Peter is talking about how we are supposed to choose hope, how we are supposed to hope fully, how it is a, a choice and how we should set our minds on it, he reinforces it with something and he says that we should prepare our minds for actions. Literally, in the Greek, it is gird up the mental loins of your mind ready to go to war. Maybe some of you women can understand this. Us men don't wear maxi dresses. But women, imagine you are wearing a maxi dress in the middle of August when it is 135 with 1,042% humidity outside. Whenever you need a little ventilation, what do you do with the maxi dress? You pull it up, not in a, in a bad way, but you pull it up. You need a little ventilation. And if you, a dog, a rabid dog is chasing you, you can't run and escape that dog with a maxi dress. Yes? So girding up your loins literally is taking that maxi dress and tying it around your waist to give you freedom so that you have the uh, capability and the action to go. When Peter is writing this, men and women both are wearing tunics and long dresses. In order to gird up your loins, you would have to take that tunic. Whenever you would have to go to work, you would take that tunic and you would tie it around your waist to give you the capability and the room to do the work. We don't necessarily have that comparison today. The best I can come up with in my little itty-bitty brain was a maxi dress in the middle of August. This is what Peter is talking about whenever we are supposed to prepare our minds. Gird up your loins. This carried a weight to the original readers in Asia Minor who would have understood very well the literal thing that Peter is saying here about tying up their tunics, getting ready to get down to work. And church, this is the kind of intentionality and seriousness with which we must prepare our minds as exiles in this world. You can wake up and you can go through your day all laissez-faire if you want to. But the Bible talks about how we are supposed to set our minds on hope. How we are supposed to put our hope fully on Christ. That every day, whenever we wake up, there is a spiritual war at play. You can choose to go without your sword in this world if you want to. But I want to be as well equipped and well defended from this life as much as possible. I want to be able to defend my household and myself well against the spiritual attacks of Satan and his forces. This girding up your loins is getting ready for battle. There are far too many Christians and people in this world walking through life as if it is a laissez-faire easy going, laid back. There are no problems ever going to come this way. I'm just going to go through life and yet trouble is right here waiting to pounce. Satan going around like a roaring lion waiting to devour every single one of us. You could choose to leave the house without the sword in the word. You could choose to arm yourself. Set your hope fully on Christ. Some of you need to stop feeding the negative thoughts in your mind with whatever it is, it is is to enter into your brain. Some of you need to stay off of Fox News and CNN and MSNBC and any other news channel out there because all it's doing is just making you angry, fueling the cynicism that lays deep within your heart. 
to the point of whenever your kids come home from school, you are ready to bubble over because of the anger that what has been defeating to you. Some of you may need to stay off the social media websites of Snapchat and TikTok and Instagram and all the other ones that we can fill in because all those things do is just make you mad, fill you with the world rather than filling you with the word. Peter says the second thing that we need to do is to live holy. Look with me in verses 14 through 16. Peter says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But he who has called you is holy. You also be holy in all of your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Holy simply means to be set apart. It doesn't mean to be perfect. Holy simply means to be set apart. I love, I could eat a million and one donut holes. They're good. They got just the right amount of dough, not enough glaze. You can always use more of that. But the donut hole is just the right size. It is holy because it's set apart from the rest of the donut. See, now you all always remember what holy is. Living holy and being set apart in this world does not happen overnight or immediately when you become a Christian. Amen? Whenever you become a Christian, your life all of a sudden does not start lining up perfectly with what the Word of God says. I still have a whole lot of things to work out in my life to be more holy, to be closer to what Jesus looks like than what I look like right now. How about you? There's a whole lot of things that God is still chiseling away at me. Mm, Michael, you still got a few anger problems. Chisel away here. Michael, your patience isn't exactly the best over here with this particular church member. I'm going to chisel away at that there. Man, somebody cut you off in traffic this week, Michael. You, you just didn't have a good reaction. I'm going to chisel a little bit right there. He's doing the same in your life. It's not just me. I'm highlighting in my life there are things that are going on in my life that are still being worked out by God to be conformed into the image of Christ. Being holy does not mean being perfect. I think so many people get this wrong in the Christian life. The Christian life is about progress, not perfection. You and I, every single day, we can choose to wake up and we can choose to have a holy life. We are trying to walk in the footsteps of Christ. But are you making progress or are you not? Is God conforming you into the image of his son or is he not? Because if you're going through this life and you can't tell a difference between the way that you used to be before you knew Christ and the way that you are right now, you may want to check on yourself. Do you have a pulse with Christ? Are you even getting into the Bible to get to know him more? Are you coming to church on a consistent basis? Not because that is a, a mechanism to get into heaven, but because that is what fuels holiness in your life. Are you doing some of these things or are you not? As I mentioned last week, I can look around this room and I can see so many people and know their stories about how God has changed them. And the person that they were is not the person that they are now. God reminds me every day of the person that I used to be because I see so much of it in my children. So much of the short patience, the anger problems, the stubbornness and the hard-headedness, all the bad things they got from me. I can see it all in them as they're playing out in their life. And I'm reminded I used to be just like that. Not that I am perfect now. I remember all of the hard shaping my parents had to walk me through for me to be a good man. Hopefully a man worthy of respect. A well-mannered person. I remember all of those things because I see it playing out in my children. I'm reminded of the man that my father used to be before Christ. His little quirky self that he is now, yeah, he's always quirky. But it wasn't quirky for Jesus. I'm reminded when I look around this room about the great transformational work that God has done on so many of you. Not that you are perfect, but I can see the progress that you are making as you are trying to get closer and closer to God. And he is helping to form you into the image of his son. This is what Peter is talking about here. Yet when we look around in this world, we see a culture that is bent on something entirely different. 
to live in a culture of my truth. Where you can't question what I believe because, well, it's my truth. We live in a culture where any sense of accountability or correctingness, where we are trying to look at someone's life and say, hey, I see that you got a little bit of a problem here. Any of that is met with fierce anger and violence and how dare you talk about me. We want to cite Matthew 7, 1 of only God can judge me and this, that, and the other. We want to go to war at somebody just for trying to say, hey, I see that you're not really acting like you say that you're supposed to be acting right now. You're being a little mean towards your wife. You're not really being a present father. When we ask people about that, man, it's full out war. When we say, yeah, I see how you're living your life, but the Bible says this, oh, it's on. You want to talk about how somebody wants to go to war? You just get onto the online sphere, not that you should. You just go to a college campus and say, yeah, this isn't exactly God's design for what he intended for your relationships. Here was God's intent. And it's on. We live in a culture that is dictated by so many things where my truth reigns supreme. And you better not question my reality, my distorted reality of life. We're willing to burn everything down for anyone who disagrees with us politically, spiritually, emotionally, the way that we want to live out our lives. We're ready to burn it all down just because somebody doesn't agree with how you're doing things. I both love and hate this quote from Tim Keller. He says that if you're good, if your God never disagrees with you, you might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. You see how that stings? Like, man, I like it. It's a good quote. But then it stings because I start questioning the things that are in my mind and whether or not my God is correcting me or not. Whether my God is helping to align me so that my life is according to his will and not mine. And so many people in this world have a standard of right and wrong that is not defined by the word of God, but is defined rather by an idealized version of themselves, in which they are never wrong. Questioning them is a full-on frontal assault against the God that they are worshiping, which is themselves. As Rick and I have said over and over again many times, we can go to our office, we can cry, we can talk about the things of Scripture, we can talk about what is right, we can talk about what is wrong, but we cannot change what the Bible says. Now, I'm not going to apologize for what the Scripture says. I'm not going to try to walk around it all casually like this is not what the Word of God says. This is what the word of God says about X. You could fill in the blank with a number of things. I'm not calling out any one particular thing this morning. I'm just saying broadly that when the word of God says that something is right or wrong, it doesn't matter whether I agree with it or not. The word of God says it. And I'm supposed to align my life to it. That is the standard, not me. And when you are worshiping a God who never disagrees with you, you're worshiping yourself. When I look at scripture, I look at my life and I see, Michael, you are doing an awful job lining up here. Maybe you do the same, or maybe your God never disagrees with you, never corrects you. Jesus both corrects and comforts at the same time. It is not like he is standing out there with a, a judgment sword, coming off the top ropes with an elbow ready to just take you out. That is not what Jesus is doing. He is seen as the good shepherd, the counselor who helps to comfort us. I am not standing up here trying to pronounce judgment and condemnation on any of this. I am simply trying to say that when the word of God says something, I am not going to apologize for it and neither should you. Regardless of whether culture says something is right or wrong, we are called to align our lives with the word of God. This is what it means to be holy. And yet when we look around the landscape of this world, people who call themselves Christians, who sit in church perhaps every Sunday, who maybe perhaps are deacons or pastors or elders or whatever the thing is, they are living their lives in such a way that they think that they are getting away with something just because it is a secret, just because they think that the rest of the church doesn't know. Yet the word of God is standing there waiting to correct and comfort, and many people just won't have it. 
I don't say that lying is a sin. God does. I don't say that homosexuality is a sin. God does. I don't say that stealing from your boss is a sin. God does. I don't say that I could fill in the blank with a whole lot of things that are going on in our culture right now. I don't say that any of that is a sin. God does. It's whether or not you want to believe it and line your life up with it or not. That is the question. Peter calls for you and I to be holy. Are you? Here's the thing about this. God isn't trying to take something away from you. He's trying to give you something. He's trying to say, hey, within these boundaries, here is life. You can have it. You have a choice, just like Joshua. You have a choice before you today. Choose death or life. Which one do you want? The people of Israel, just like all of us in here, I'll take life, please. Thank you. And God says, okay, here are the parameters. Here are the boundaries that you get to live within. You're going to do your money this way. You're going to live your life this way. Your language and your behavior are going to fit within this box. Not in a legalistic sense. Not in a, hey, I'm trying to take all the good things that are out here on the outskirts of life. Those aren't the good things. God is saying the good things are within this box. God's designed for sex. God's designed for marriage. God's designed for the family. God's designed for your money. God's designed for a whole lot of things. All of it is life right here within this box. Yet all of us like dumb sheep are sitting around looking saying, no, I like the grass over there. I think I'm going to get outside of that box. That's where the good things are. And God is saying, no, that is death. And we being the dumb sheep that we are want to go and get it. We want to go and eat on it. Fill our big old fat bellies, go home and take a good Sunday afternoon nap. That is what we want to choose and run to. God is not trying to take something from you. God is trying to give you life. Just whether or not we want to line our lives up with the Bible or not. We are called to live a holy life. A life that is set apart from the rest of the world around us. And how we act, how we talk, how we think. That is the life that God is calling us to. And yet so many Christians who walk like the world, who talk like the world, who think like the world, who act like the world, our marriages aren't any different than the world. We want to apologize for what the Bible says just to try and appease a culture that is watering down the gospel. Just to try and reach the people. I'm all about reaching them. Again, I am not preaching condemnation. I am trying to reach out in love and say the box is where life is. You are in death and you think that you are happy, but here is where you are called to be. This is what God is calling for all of you this morning. When you are walking in sin, you are walking closer to death. The call is to be holy. Not perfect, but walking closer and closer with the footsteps of Jesus every single day. Because that is where the goodness of life is. The third thing that Peter says is that we are called to walk in reverence. Quickly, verses 17 through 21, Peter says, And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout your time in exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb. Without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world that was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter says that as exiles in this world, we are to conduct ourselves with a right fear of God. This is not terror, walking around waiting on God to pop out of the corner like some kind of evil spirit waiting to kill us for some kind of sin or action that we do that does not line up with the word of God. But this is a fear that is a good reverence. God is not just a lamb. He is also a lion. Any of y'all ever been around a fainting goat before? Whenever you understand that that is a fainting goat, what is the first thing that you want to do? Ah! Ha! Got the goat to fall. <laughs> I scared it. Let me do it again. Right? 
That's what you want to do with a fainting goat. None of you are doing that with a lion. Even if they say that it is a tame lion, a circus lion, a lion that even perhaps may be behind a cage, and you think that a little eight-inch piece of wire is going to separate that lion from you, you're even then, you are not going to have the boldness to jump at that lion. You are not going to want to clap at it because there is a sense of awe and terror and right fear that you have for the lion because you understand that on the food chain between you and the lion, you lose every time. Even with the sword, even with some of y'all, all of your armored up zombie theory crafting things that you got at home with all the guns you got stocked in the gun shelf, even if I had all of those strapped on me ready to roll, I'm still going to want some distance in between me and that lion. Yet so many people want to walk around, again, with some bumper sticker theology about how Jesus is their friend. Sure, Jesus is the friend of sinners. Sure, Jesus comforts us in our time of need. Yes, all of those things are right. But Jesus is the Lion of Judah who will one day, all of us will stand before him, completely naked and exposed in our sin and our shame. Him understanding everything that has transpired in your mind or physically in this world. Understanding all of that, you will be exposed before the Lion of Judah. This is a sense of awe and fear and reverence that we should have toward God. And we should walk in that way. There are so many people who walk around in this world as saying that God is a God of love and I'm not going to have to fear him. And God's not going to send me to hell because of this, that, and the other. And while they may have those ideas, what does scripture say? This is the weight that we are called to live and walk in every day as exiles in this world. One day, every single one of us will stand before the Lion of Judah. And he will look at us and say, well done, my faithful servant, or depart from me, for I never knew you. Which one is he going to say to you? Are you walking in holiness? Are you walking like the world? We must wage war in our hearts and minds to put to death every single sin that keeps us from living our lives as exiles, set apart as holy exiles. We must put it all aside. And some of us, we love the thing. We love the sin so much more than we love the God of the Bible. We love the sin more than we love Jesus. That is at the heart of every single sin that you have. You love it. You're willing to fight for it and protect it. You run back to it every time because you love that sin. So how are you doing this morning? How are you doing on the hope that you have in this world? Is it set on Christ? Is your hope fully set on Christ? Or is it just kind of a, yeah, I'll get to heaven one day. But right now, I'm really worried about my job. Right now, I'm just trying to fight in the trenches to get through the day. I'm just fighting for this week because this week is awful, and I've got this coming up with school, and I've got that coming up with work, and my kids have all of these things going on. I'm just trying to win the day, but my hope is not fully set on Christ. I'm not saying that we have to ignore the things of this world, but how is your hope being set in this world? As I mentioned, some of you probably need to gird up your loins and get rid of some things that you are listening to in your life. Gird up the loins of your mind to be prepared fully so that your mind can be set on the good things of this life rather than on the bad things of this life. How are you doing as exiles in this world? Are you more concerned about what others will think about you if they found out about that sin than you are being concerned about what the holy God of the universe sees already walk around in our sin we're concerned about what somebody else may think about me if they only knew I had an addiction to this we're more concerned about the people sitting around us than we are about the God of the universe who already sees it how are you doing on walking in outright disobedience with God how's that going for you maybe there's some things in your life that you need to straighten up and get closer aligned with what the word of God said rather than being blatantly disobedient, walking in it every single day. Maybe it is time for you to repent. Maybe it's time for you to 
come into a relationship with Christ. I don't know what it is for you this morning, but I pray that the God of the universe who sees you and loves you just as you are, because while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. Maybe now is the first time that you want to commit your life to Christ. I don't know what it is, but I pray that God is working on your heart so that you can align your life to live as holy exiles in this world. Will you stand with me? God, we praise you and we thank you that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And God, even now when so many of us perhaps are still walking in blatant disobedience to you, you are still right here with your arms wide open, ready to receive us in love. Not judgment, but God, may we live our lives with a holy reverence, understanding that one day judgment is going to come. Whether we get our life right right now or not, God, every single one of us are going to stand before the throne room of heaven. And every one of us is going to hear the words, either well done, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, for I never knew you. God, may we be challenged and convicted to live our lives holy and set apart in this life so that we can walk in obedience with you. God, you are calling us to life. And yet every time we want to run outside of those boundaries, God, challenge us. Mold us, shape us into your image. God, love us so that we can continue to walk with you. It is in your holy and precious son's name we do pray. Amen.